Anton, happy new year. Happy new year, Packy. Good to see you. I hope you had a good holiday. You too. And to everybody out there watching and listening, happy holidays, happy new year. Welcome back to Anton Teaches Packy AI, episode five. We are not talking about a specific paper this time, but we're talking about something that shows up in every single one of the papers that we talk about, which is the data set that these models are trained on and that they use. And so today we're just going to talk about data. Anton, where's the best place to start when we talk about the data that these models are using? Yeah. Um, I mean, let's let's start at the beginning, right? We've done a lot in this series so far to go over the history of AI and machine learning. Um, and we've talked about data at sort of every step. Um, but one thing that we've sort of left aside is how those data sets are created in the first place. So in the early days of machine learning or what's now considered the early days, even though it's like 2012, um, the data sets that people use to train models were very specifically created for that purpose. So a great example of this is the digits recognition data set, which was created specifically for the purpose, like MNIST digits, was created specifically for the purpose of solving this challenge of recognizing digits. And then people sort of use this as a general test data set um, for a bunch of machine learning models. And MNIST is you know, considered fairly out of date these days, but it was created specifically for these purpose. And then later on, other people created other data sets. There's a lot um, of relatively famous ones. There's like one where it's about like flowers, um, being able to like categorize flowers based on, based on images. And then people made more general data sets like CIFAR, like ImageNet, um, like COCO, which is collection of objects in context, which were all specifically created for machine learning. And for a long time, these are the data sets that were used both for training and evaluation of most ML models. And the reason that they were used in part was building a big data set is hard, uh, especially to make sure it's like relatively clean. Um, it's fit for purpose. It's got a good diversity um, of sort of examples and content. Um, so there were only a few. And then like there's a, there's a big one for self-driving called Kitty, which was very specially collected by, you know, a special car driving around with special sensors on it. And that was used for a lot of tasks, particularly interesting to self-driving and robotics. And so these were like custom bespoke data sets, very, very, very like specifically built for these purposes. Um, but if we look at what we call, you know, let's say modern machine learning, and by modern machine learning, I mean, especially generative models like GPT, like stable diffusion, stuff that we've talked about recently. The data that those models are fed is very, very large and it's infeasible for a human being to curate data sets of that scale. So for example, the stable diffusion data set uh, called Lion, which you know is publicly available, you can go visit it. It's based on common crawl and we'll talk about that later. It has 5 billion images in it. It's not feasible for humans to efficiently like inspect that entire data set, um, clean it up, make sure it has what you want in it. It's unstructured. For the structured data sets that you're talking mm. about before, how big were those? Pretty big. Like, you know, order order hundreds of thousands of images for the large ones. Um, or like sequences, long sequences in the case of video data sets, which are very useful in self-driving, um, point clouds, things like that. But thousands, hundreds of thousands, I mean, they grew. They kept growing over time as people sort of learned to leverage resources more. Um, they're pretty big, but nothing on the scale of what's needed to train. And there was a AI. human checking each one of the images and saying like, yep, this is what this image says it is, or what was the human involvement then that we've now taken out? Yeah, so at that time, the data sets need, need to be labeled, right? Both for testing and evaluation, because this is you know kind of classic machine learning. Um, and so humans would, and not necessarily one person, but like a group of humans using tools would go in and annotate those data sets. And the thing is, you'd find that the data sets are noisy. Even looking in MNIST, there are plenty of errors in MNIST. There are digits that are like really ambiguous and you can't actually tell what the person had written down. Um, you can, there are like numbers with parts of them cut off. Like there's a lot of, there's a lot of sevens in the MNIST data set where like the tail is cut off. So it could be a one. There's a lot of errors. So even with human labeling, like the data sets were not guaranteed to be perfect. But generally people would like use a set of tools. Sometimes those tools would be cross-referenced. And you kind of see that even with 
the way Google does captchas now, where like it's designed to like help out Street View by showing you a, a little box and asking you like which of these boxes contain a thing. Yeah. That's a way to like do object detection by showing it to millions of people and just finding out where the most like correlated um, boxes are. So and then will this get rid of that kind of? Ca I'm so tired of that kind of capture. Will this? Will the unstructured world of, of data get rid of that? Um, I doubt it. I think <laughs> I think captures exist uh, have existed before machine learning and will continue to exist for a long time. Because that particular of kind though is just such a bummer because like is that little corner? I mean, and maybe it actually doesn't mm. score me on whether I got that little corner right or no. not. But if I'm actually like responding like a human would but I want to get it right. And, and so every time I'm like, I don't know if that's a bicycle or not. I can't even see it in the background. It tries to show you things that it's confident of and a few things that it's less less confident of. And it like scores you based on the things that it knows are right. And then the other ones it can like let you go kind of either way. Um, hmm. it's, it's, again, it's like trying to refine an object detection. So basically back to our original point, the way these those data sets were created was one way or another humans would like go in and label the data at scale, um, either like literally an effort to create a labeled data set or leveraging tools that scale like this, like a CAPTCHA system or sort of any number of things, right? Um, and that's, again, that's no longer feasible, not for training like a GPT or a, or stable diffusion. You, you can't, it's just 5 billion images is too many. Yeah. I mean, think about it, right? 5 billion images, there are 8 billion people. <laughs> well, if we all do one, then we're good. Yeah, if, well, if, if we all do one, we're good, but then we all have to write a caption for it as well. Um, and we better hope that we all do it, right? Otherwise, we get something very noisy. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe maybe that's the future. We don't know yet. I think this oh, is God. actually a really interesting <laughs> open problem. Yeah, you think you think the little self-driving captures are bad. Um, you wait until the capture is, caption this image. No, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I don't see why not. Um, as we learned, especially from the chinchilla paper, data is all important. Yeah, It doesn't matter how much compute you have if you don't have as not, uh, enough data to sort of back it. Every doubling of compute, as we remember, requires a doubling of data. So pretty quickly, you get out of the realm of what humans even collectively can hope to really clean up and label. Yeah, And that's, that's before even the special things that you need for your data set. And we'll get into that in a bit too for, for that kind of model. All right, so that takes us back to where we are today, which is unstructured data, big five billion image data sets. Mm -hmm. What's going on in those in those big data sets right now? Like when when Stable Diffusion looks at this data set, what's what's happening? Yeah, so I think it's interesting to talk about where those data sets come from and and what changed. Yeah. So the big thing that changed was the web. The web suddenly made a vast quantity of data available, um, essentially publicly. Because of the way the web works, you know, you display an image, it ends up on somebody else's computer through the internet. Um, and people are posting like millions and millions and millions of images a day across all kinds of different services. Suddenly there's this vast trove of data available. And so different data sets packaged up that available data in different ways. So one of the earliest things back, uh, you know, a little while ago, Common Crawl has been around for a little while, I'll explain what that is. A little while ago, people realized that the big internet companies, they have access to all this data and it's like behind closed doors, it's theirs, right? They don't really wanna give it to anyone, but that gives them a monopoly on business and research despite the fact that that data came from like, you know, people created it. Google didn't make it. Facebook didn't create that data. People on those services created that data. And so there was a big sort of call for like, well, these companies shouldn't be the only ones who have access to something at that larger scale because only they will ever be able to do anything with it. I think I remember too, Instagram updated its terms of service at some point or Facebook did or both of them did combined and said like, we own all your images now. I mean, so, de facto, yeah, people were not happy. De facto, there's a good, there's a few good reasons why they had to say that. But yeah, people were definitely unhappy about that. Um, and there was an effort put together um, to create 
data sets of a similar scale, but that were publicly available. So they're, they're not hidden behind like the walled gardens and in the servers of your Googles and Facebooks and so on. And that one of those efforts was called Common Crawl. Um, Common Crawl is a very large data set of links um, with metadata. Uh, it's not perfect, again, but it's basically Common Crawl sent out scrapers to the web, crawlers to the web, just like Google does to index, to create its search index, and collected a vast amount of information about the web. Just the same way, exactly the same way that Google search indexing does. Yeah. Um, and that's actually a complex problem. You might think, oh, I'll just like write a little scraper, uh, run it on my computer. But if you want to do this at, at like truly web scale, uh, which was a buzzword a few years ago, um, you have to be really smart about it. You have to make sure you have enough compute. You have to make sure you have enough storage to actually store the indices and then you know, do something useful with them. So Common Crawl did that. And Common Crawl became a very useful thing. It allowed people to sort of bootstrap ideas and perform research that otherwise wouldn't have been possible because otherwise you'd have to ask for Google's data and Google would just say no. Because uh, Google would really like to have Google's data. Of course. And who, like when we say Common Crawl, mm -hmm. what is it? Who is it? How is it funded? Is it open source? Is it a team yep. of volunteers from around the world? Like what is Common Crawl? So Common Crawl is a nonprofit. It's a 501c corp. Um, and it's freely available. It's open source. And also their crawlers and everything are open source. Um, the people who work there are paid to do it, oh. um, but it's a nonprofit foundation. Cool. Um, was founded in 2007 as a 501c3. And its, its purpose is, like I said, to make sure that large centralized web companies aren't the only people who have access to this kind of data at this kind of scale. It's, it's pretty cool that you needed the past 20 years or whatever of the internet that we were able to upload photos to get to this point that you needed somebody in 2007 to say like, if we're heading in this direction anyway, we should actually really, it'd be great if we had an open source database of all of these yeah. images. And then 15 years later, or I guess at that point, 10 years later, we get transformers and like the thing just kind of keeps evolving. And yeah. here we are with all of the necessary pieces kind of in place. Yeah. I mean, maybe maybe a different you know uh, architecture wins if we don't have all of the data that we need or something different happens, but it is fun to look back and see how many steps were needed to get to where we are right now. Yeah, and, and this is like the, the people like point to compute and hardware. They say, oh, GPUs improved a lot. No, the availability of data is was just absolutely huge and the ability to access that data efficiently as well. Like internet bandwidth is a big deal for machine learning research. Um, just because it's 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 a way to get public data. It's a way to actually move it around and get it to where the compute needs it. So that's common crawl. You know, people then started creating large data sets, which were not necessarily labeled, but as we've talked about, one of the great things about generative models is you don't need labeled data. Um, nobody needs to like write down, oh, this is a picture of a cat. It's more like the, the form of training is like called unsupervised. Yep or self-supervised training where all the information that you need, like all it's trying to do is predict what's next in its data set or predict something from its data set. It's not trying to like classify or, or return the correct label or anything like that. It's just trying. There to is still though the, like there are the captions that might be associated with something yeah. on a website or, but it's just not somebody going through the data set and manually saying like, this is a, an orange yeah. striped cat with a bullet. Yeah, so note. let's, let, let's talk a little bit about that. Right. So, so there's a, there's a vast amount of text online. Um, that text is stored in very different places. Um, it has different licensing, different availability. Um, and so getting the data for something like training a GPT or training a co-pilot, um, you, know, you need to have access to GitHub data. Um, and there are licensing issues and co-pilot is facing some of those licensing issues right now. Um, so it's sort of like, where this data comes from, it's it's due to this vast amount of information that's been created and posted to the web, uh, and then is accessed in one way or another. And Common Crawl is an example of a vast index. It's an index of web pages scraped from the web. Got it. So if the less wrong crowd is right, we're going to really regret this 20-year period where we just created all of this data for free on the internet that the AI used to kill us all. <laughs> Oh, I don't know. I mean, like, I, th I think most of the, like, the data on the internet is like people talking about their favorite TV show or about how much they like cats. So I know like, we, I, I think if this is the 20 year period though, in which we were just creating data without anything yeah. happening. And then, you know, 
10 years from now or 100 years from now we all died into that like i think we really would have wished that we would have kept those conversations maybe on the phone or offline oh like i said i think i think actually most conversations on the web are are pretty friendly like my take on oh interesting yeah like my take on like my take on or like reddit is another huge source of like actual conversational text um the reddit database is is like of use and they do let you use it for research uh, i think they have like a, a a snapshot of it that you can use um and there's like there's other stuff too um but i think generally like i have i have i have this take on ai alignment um for generative models especially which is like well we're kind of already there we got it we we got it for free um because the model just does what humans would do all it does is like generate it doesn't have any agency it doesn't have any yeah. volition uh, although i've been in debates recently where people say that it does um not sure that I agree. Well, I'll have to go into those arguments. Like a current deeper. versions do. Yeah, people people like may have made the argument to me that fine tuning with um, with an external objective means the model has agency. I don't really agree with that. Um, I can I, like I think I need to see a really convincing argument. I haven't seen one. Yeah. Um, but anyway, like going back to what I was saying is like it's it's like if AI alignment is do what a human would do in this situation. That's exactly what we have. We got it for free. True. Because <laughs> like, we're training it on what it humans have done in billions and billions and billions of situations. Yeah. yeah. And, and like all it does is try to predict like the next thing that like a human would plausibly do here. Um, so it kind of seems like we just got alignment for free, which is kind of nice. In my opinion, that's really great. Um, but also because like, I mean, I think that goes to show also how much of an unexpected direction the thing that we think is now closest to AGI came from. It didn't come from like these agentic things trying to solve problems in the world. It's like, mm -mm, just try to model text. We're fine. We're just going to model the text, predict it. It has no agency. It just does what we ask it to do. I actually think that like the last 20 years of text on the web are mostly pretty friendly. Like, okay, there's political debates, but mm, whatever. So yeah. what? There's roughly, there's like roughly an equal amount of nonsense content coming from everywhere all at once. It's, it's hard to imagine that it would really cause a problem. Um, it's also kind of nice that it's frozen in time. Yeah. One now. thing that we ought to talk about later as well is the fact that now AI content is getting posted. So the data sets are, maybe the data sets of the future are kind of going to be like contaminated. And a few people are working on that problem. So we'll see. Well, I was also going to ask about, you know, the same thing for images and maybe we can, we can get there, but like if we double and double and double and double the amount of compute and we run out of internet images are we going to just be creating synthetic images with ai and does that work or do well, they i mean need... people are always going to be making images we've been making images literally since prehistory yeah right we're not going to stop um just because ai models can create images based on what they've seen before it doesn't mean humans are going to stop creating images no i get that i'm just saying if we need like a hundred billion images in these data sets and they can't reach, you know, there's no way to get hundred billion images other than synthetically creating them. Does that do anything to the data set? If we, if we just start throwing it does. AI generated, it, it does. It does. You can think of it as like, so the AI really can only create images based on what it's, what's in its training set. You can kind of regard an AI generated image as a distilled uh, version of something in its training set or like a set of things from its training set. Again, it's more complicated than that, but that's a good shorthand, mental shorthand. And so if you're then like taking those outputs, training a model on them again, all you're doing is kind of recycling yeah. the same data. And you can imagine like this idea in, in dynamics is called like a stable attractor. But if you keep feeding the same data back in, you, you'll be in this like loop where it just refines yeah. the same stuff over and over and over again until you can't really go any further. Um, but, you know, again, there's like noise and stuff in the system that makes it stochastic. You'll get like surprising stuff sometimes. But generally speaking, you need new input. You need it. You need to get it somewhere. And maybe the models in the future will also be able to go out and get it for themselves, um, which yeah. I think is like closer to autonomy, closer to actual AI than what we have to be. Okay, so common crawl, right? Common crawl, great index on the internet. So then, but now we want to train, you know, models that can do stuff with images. And you have, you know, DALI, and like I mentioned, right, there's all these different data sets lying around the web and you need a lot of data. So DALI, when OpenAI was doing that, they made deals with stock photo websites. They like grabbed as many image data sets as they could find. 
they did a great job of also trying to clean them up um, as much as they could. And, and then, you know, they fed all of that to Dali. Now, stable diffusion, in comparison, used only publicly available data. And the way that they did this is there is a data set called Lion. And what Lion is, is it is images from common crawl. So this data set that was created to scrape the web, Lion took that data set and looked for images. So and they went to all the links. They pulled down the images, essentially? Yeah, well, they didn't pull them down. Actually, Lion is also only an index. They don't store any images. A lion is only an index. So they um, went through all the, as many images as they could find in the common crawl data set. They like used, you know, they used clip on them and their captions. They encoded them and created this data set to train stable diffusion. So again, lion is just a publicly available index. You can go to lion and, and get it. And that's what the researchers from LMU used to train stable diffusion, LMU and runway ML. But here's the thing, nobody who created those images in the first place really agreed to this. And I think in fact, most people until generative art showed up or generative AI generative image models showed up, realized that Lion or Common Crawl actually existed. People are very surprised, were very yeah. surprised to learn, wait a minute, my data is where? It's being used for what? And especially in, in art, but we've also seen this in code. Um, like people, people are putting a class action lawsuit together, I think, because of Copilot. Yeah. Because it uses, you know, open source it code publicly. Sense, yeah. From GitHub. Um, but in, in, in many places, attribution is very important. And because there wasn't permission, and because there isn't attribution yet, it creates a really big problem. And I think this is something where technologists and creators are really talking past each other, especially in the art world right now. Um, but that's, that's where the data comes from. It comes from these vast web data sets of scraped data. And the captions come from either the image alt text or like if it's really obvious in the metadata where the caption is, you can pull that out too uh, for training stable diffusion. And just for clarification, so on the Lion set, Mm. That's publicly available data. People don't mm. know their, their information's in there. Mm. What OpenAI used for Dolly is some stock photos. So those people have given permission. Some mm -hmm. data sets from the, like, is that less of an issue with Dolly or is it the same kind of issue because they use a bunch of data sets? I think it's less of an issue for Dolly because I think OpenAI were more scrupulous in obtaining licenses uh, and obtaining you know, access. I'm sure there's stuff in there that's also like gray. Um, but they also did like a pretty strong job, especially with Dali two of like filtering out sexual or violent content as we've talked about before. Yep. Um, so I think that open AI probably did a better job, but they also have the resources to do so. Totally. Right? Like, you know, if, if Lion back in the day before stability really got all that funding, went to Shutterstock and was like, we'd like to do a deal with you to make this data set publicly available for machine learning, they probably would have gotten told no. Yeah. OpenAI has got Microsoft behind them. So. And today announced they're raising money at a $29 billion That's valuation. Right. That's right. Congratulations to them. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a bold move and a, a strong move to just do that as a tender. We don't need the cash. We're just, you know, we'll, we'll sell you some of our shares. Pretty, things are going pretty well over there. Yeah, I think people are pretty happy. Um, especially the people who I know who work at OpenAI are pretty happy yeah. right now. But anyway, yeah, I would I would say that OpenAI's data for Dali uh, and also its text data for GPT, uh, Chat GPT, which is obviously huge right now, um, is probably like cleaner in that sense. It's probably not perfect. I think it would be I think it would be easy to find examples if OpenAI ever let anyone look at their data, which they won't. And could you do attribution then on Dali more easily? because of that or it's still just like we know that because it's licensed and in, in these licensed data sets that at least it's above board but it's still hard to do attribution attribution is a complex problem um and it depends on the model architecture it depends on things like what encoding was used what model was used for encoding because we talked about clip last time yeah. but there's a bunch of there's a bunch of models that you can do that like 
Stable Diffusion 2 uses, uh, Stable Diffusion originally used Clip. So in other words, they used OpenAI's API to create the embeddings for the images and captions. Um, now they use OpenClip, which is uh, an open source version of Clip, again, trained on Lion, because it's got the images and captions uh, to do that encoding. Um, so all of these things make attribution kind of a tough, non-obvious problem to solve. Um, it, takes, it takes work. Um, and the initial solutions won't be perfect, but attribution is necessary, so we'll work on it. Um, but I don't think it actually makes the attribution easier. I think mm -hmm. it's just as easy so long as you know what is in the training set. Um, and in fact, I would say that attribution publicly for, for like other researchers working on the attribution problem is easier for stable diffusion because we know for sure what it was trained on. Or at least like what what they claim, yeah. but I don't I don't think they have any reason to like not tell the truth around that. I think it would be silly. Um, as you've as you've looked through the data, and I'm hmm. sure you haven't seen all five billion images, but like not yet. Maybe so. Should. Can you tell like there is something for everything that you know? Like, it makes sense that these images would have come from this data set. Lion is a very general set of images. Yeah, it's everything from like. PowerPoint slide from like an insane conspiracy theory all the way up to like macro photography of Michelangelo's David in high, in like high definition and high dynamic range. Right. Got so it, it's, yeah. it's like trash in there. And also a lot of the time the captions don't really match the images or there's a lot of redundancy. So one example of redundancy is it's the same picture, but it's got five different captions because either it like appears in different places on the web or the captions mm. are in different languages or they're describing different properties of the same image, which creates problems for like encoding and one of the reasons that the data set is so noisy. Um, one other thing that Lion does is they provide an aesthetically filtered version of the data set where they basically trained another model to like score every image by is this pretty or not uh, using, using some human feedback on like what, what people think would say is pretty or not. Um, and is and pretty they're... actually what they were mm -hmm. going for? Or is mm -hmm. it like this PowerPoint slide can actually still be useful because it's an image and like mm -hmm. we need to make images of power? No, just pretty. Oh, just Like I said, it's impossible for a person to go through all 5 billion images, but we can train a machine learning model, which will very rapidly look at all of them and assign them a score from one to 10. And then you mm -hmm. can kind of like threshold it and say, okay, I'm only going to take six and a half and above um, into, the, into the data that I used to train my model. Right. Very and that's the other thing. The other thing, there's there's a lot of not safe for work imagery in there because it's the internet. Yeah. Um, most of the so images on the internet, I would imagine, are not safe for work at this point. I don't know if that's true. I think most are, um, but I think it's really no, easy it's, to run across. Yeah, there's like the internet bandwidth use of porn yeah. is like a huge percentage, but I guess that's video takes up a, a pretty yeah. large percentage. I also think that realistically that's this a smaller subset of images that are just being viewed more often rather than a large huh. set of all images that's how i would yeah. mentally model that, that um not to not to discuss porn internet porn economics right now in the we're talking about there, right? we're talking about internet images i mean that's part of the story that's true that's true i'm surprised um, that ai hasn't hasn't like other technologies been more used for porn yet oh it's definitely being used for porn uh, let, let's talk I, it's about it's that not in like a the killer use case that maybe it, it was. Oh, I, let, let's talk really? about that in a sec. I want to I want to bring that up uh, in, a, in okay. a minute because I think that's an interesting path. But what I wanted to get at was um, the other thing that they did was they trained a model to detect not safe for work imagery. Uh, it's called like or like other content you don't want in there. Um, it's called the safety model, and they also turned that on for training. Um, Stable diffusion, similar to how OpenAI also like tried to clean their data set, they also clean their data set by training another model and having that model look at the entire vast data set. So they labeled a small amount of the whole data set and then they trained a model to go look. Um, both of them did that because again, it's infeasible. So we've got models now curating the training data to feed the very large models because no human can actually ever look at all the data. And so a question- Or I would say they, they could, it's just infeasible. Yeah, because stable diffusion's open source like when people mm -hmm. are getting stable diffusion, like the open source, everything that comes with it, can they turn on and off the safety model? Or is that something that's like baked in? It's kind of baked in. Um, cool. So it's baked in at training time. So once you download the stable diffusion model as it is, or you download a checkpoint, you get what you get. That's what's in there. Um, cool. That said, you know, the, the, the safety model is not perfect. Uh, it's a machine learning model. It's not going to catch everything. 
because of that, you can still get it to like generate unsavory imagery. Um, if you find like the right set of prompts or the right set of captions, you can you can probably still get it to do that. Got it. Um, but they tried. They tried pretty hard. Um, one of the interesting things they found was with Stable Diffusion 2.1, they actually reduced the safety threshold a little bit because they were finding that it was like filtering a little bit too hard. Hmm. Yeah. Um, what kind of things was it filtering out? Oh, that's hard? a good question. Um, I think the reality is a lot of artistic imagery, especially throughout history, has been hmm. you know, nudity related and related to the human form. Uh, and I think cutting that out from a model intended to generate aesthetically pleasing images is a difficult proposition yeah. because often a lot of the time also those things are displayed in context that you definitely want to appear in your data set. Um, you know, you can't, you can't exclude all of Renaissance art because the safety filter has decided yeah. that nudity is bad, you know? Uh, well, I mean, even, time, even social media, you can tastefully post nude. Like, I mean, there's, a, there's going to be a line there that even humans aren't exactly sure where that line is. Yeah, it's a for sure. One. For sure. I remember the Instagram nipple controversy. Yeah. Um, for sure. Anyway, so, so we have these, we have these data sets. They're so large that we need machine, other machine learning models to filter them. Uh, and to sort of understand them. Um, and then that gets fed into stable diffusion. And of course, people are people because they don't know this like chain of custody almost where like somebody some at some point in history uploaded an image to the internet to, to share, to be like, cool, look at this, never would have imagined that that image would end up to generate AI imagery because it didn't exist at the time of the upload yeah. and certainly because of the way like what common crawl is for it was designed to be like it was designed for more freedom it was designed so that these huge tech companies weren't the only ones with the monopoly on this data and then now we have this chain of events where suddenly we've got these like lensa we talked about right lens yep. is doing really well but objectively lensa uses stable diffusion under the hood and stable diffusion is trained on all of this content that people created this art and photography and product photos and everything else that those people aren't really getting compensated for and they weren't really asked in the first place um and the thing is the genie's kind of out of the bottle too like that stuff's encoded in the weights even if so th there's you know there are services out there um i'll shout out have i been trained.com uh who like you can go there you can put an image in and they will tell you is this image in the data set um, and then you can request for that image and similar images to be taken out. But Genie's out of the bottle. Like even if they train the next Stable Diffusion only opt-in, Stable Diffusion 2.1, 2.2, its weights are already out there. Um, and people can keep adding to those checkpoints instead. And people, of yeah. course, and you've see, you, you see this as well, which I think is a really rough thing to do. Occasionally you'll see people like deliberately scrape an artist's gallery to get the model to be able to emulate their style without yep. any compensation, without any real recourse from the artist. And of course, because it's open source, they'll just spread the weights. And attribution is important in the art world. Like you, you need to credit your influences. You need to especially give credit to living working artists yep. for their work. Um, and it's a real shame because it means there's a lot of resistance to AI and you know, I think technologists are kind of responsible for a lot of the resistance because they've minimized this problem uh, when in fact it's a very real problem. I mean, to sort of frame this in, in terms that maybe tech people would understand a bit better, when you write a scientific paper like Stable Diffusion, you've got a bibliography because you have to cite other people's ideas and art is the same. <laughs> if, yeah. if you use a living artist's work um, without crediting them, that's plagiarism. And in the scientific community, it's the same thing. If you like lift, lift like straight up other people's papers, you're going to get severely smacked down by the community as soon as people realize. Um, but technologists have like kind of talked past that. The, the, but the fact is, is like this, these images, which artists put up or creators put up for completely different purposes. And of course they could never have anticipated this purpose because nobody anticipated stable diffusion even five years ago. Um, are now being used and they're not being credited. And so can it, you like this is real. Can you steel man the tech mm -hmm. argument? Like what would the technologist argument be as to why this is not a big deal or people shouldn't worry about it or what, yeah. whatever argument they're making? So I'll give you the the weak arguments that technologists have made and then I'll give you my version of the strong argument. 
the weak arguments they've made is if you're against this, you're standing in the way of progress, which is really not the point people are making. They're like, no, I just want credit. Yeah. Um, and that's very silly. It's a very silly thing for technologists to not try to assign credit because then you get everybody kind of pulling in the same direction. You turn AI art models into something that amplifies the work of artists instead of like subsuming it. It's almost like laundering artists' work through, hmm. through a model. It's, it's, like, yeah. it's like laundering. It's like, no, you didn't really make this. The AI made it, but you couldn't have made the AI without the artist's work in the first place. So you're yeah. kind of like laundering it as in a way and like saying, no, this, this is like made by this thing that we own. It's not made by you because it's an image that doesn't exist, hasn't existed before. So anyway, so that's, that's one like bad argument that technologists have made. The other argument that they've made is in response to an argument which many people have made that, oh, this is going to replace artists. And then technologists are like, well, there's always new tools. We always find ways to do them. And it's like, well, again, in that argument, I really think both sides are missing the point. I'm of the opinion that we won't really replace human creativity. Uh, one, because humans make images. Two, because the models are fundamentally bound by images that are created elsewhere, yep. fundamentally. So in order for those models to continue to make new things, and again, like human preferences and tastes change. The architecture that we have today, for better or worse, is very different from the architecture we had even 50 or 100 years ago. Um, artistic styles like come and go all the time. Um, even the sorts of TV shows people watch even from five years ago is totally different. Like, yeah. Even I think the great example of this is like how stale memes from five years ago seem now. Not even to from mention, a few months ago. Even yeah. From a few months ago, like how quickly they were stale. Like the Adam, Adam Levine memes were incredible for a right. good 24 hours and then right. they were old. Right. So basically without fresh content, your model is going to get stuck in whatever the taste of whenever it was trained was. Um, yeah. And humans crave novelty. So fundamentally, um, it's not a tool that can, in principle, replace humans until it, you know, uh, until it somehow figures out how to create really original stuff. And we honestly don't know how to do that yet. Of course, people are working on it. Yeah. Um, it can only really like take a snapshot of what exists today. Um, so it won't it won't replace people. Certainly in, not in the near term. And I think in the far term, people will adapt to it and use it as a tool. In fact, I've already heard of working artists who are like, oh yeah, I use this to like generate references for me. Yeah. Uh, so that I don't have to that I don't have to use like people's actual photos. I can be like, oh, I'll just type this in and get like something that kind of looks like what I want to do, and then I'll like make do my artwork from that. Um, and so that's a that's kind of a weak argument as well. It's like people are worried that it'll displace them out of their profession. Results are not really good enough yet, and when they do get good enough, I think we'll have had time to adapt uh, to the point where this is another tool in the in the working artist toolbox. Um, and the technologists who are like saying, oh, yeah, this is like, it's going to be great. It's like somebody said recently, like, oh, these artists and their elitism are like keeping art gate kept. It's, it's an insane thing to say, frankly. Yeah. Um, it's like saying that the Olympic weightlifters are keeping <laughs> weightlifting gate kept from us. Like, I guess. Um, what's, the, anyway. what's the good argument? So the good argument is this. This is a tough problem. The good argument is because of the way stable diffusion and other generative models work, the attribution problem is not trivial. It's true that almost always uh, the model generates an image that's nowhere in its training set. And the way that it uses images from its training set to generate a given image is indirect because it's not like it goes and looks up what was, oh, you know, what's in my training set that's like similar to this prompt and then I'm going to mash them together. Although there are, there is a type of model that I'm very excited about called retrieval models that do something very similar to that. Um, it's more like they learn that, okay, if you give me this text, if you give me this caption, it's, I'm going to try to like, I'm going to be like in caption space and using what I know of caption space, I'm going to iteratively create an image that gets closer and closer to an image that would have had that caption. So it's very indirect. But at the same time, the reality is that the only way it can generate any image is from the data that was in its training set. So attribution is generally possible. 
It's just a very difficult problem. And it's a problem that people have not really had an incentive to tackle because we're so early in a lot of this. And I think yeah. that a lot of different ways of doing this have not really been tried yet. Um, this one's this one's similar to the idea that that you hear often, which is all art, and, and you say that, you know, when there is a direct kind of reference, mm. it's important to cite your your kind of inspirations and your mm. references. But a lot of art and creativity is just like, I heard this song yeah. six weeks ago and it got like yeah. it earwormed me. And then I saw this piece of art and then I by myself came up with this thing. But because all those other things were floating around in my head, it yeah. sounds like in this argument, it's a little it's kind of close to that. It's close ish. Idea. It's close ish, but I would say for the model, it's much more explicitly like that. Right. It's much more explicitly because I saw this, this, and this, and this, this is what I'm going to create. Yeah. It has a better memory of its sources than I do. Yeah. And it's not even really a memory because another way to think about it is like this you can think of it as a hierarchy of concepts, right? So remember, the big innovation in stable diffusion and models like it is this idea that we can encode text and images in the same space. Yep. So we want an image and the and a text like to encode them somehow that they encode to the same thing. That's the big innovation. Yep. And so this is where this more explicit part comes in. So you have a hierarchy like the concept of head, for example, human head, right? Appears in art almost everywhere in art. Can't point to a like can't say this head is definitely like this concept of head if you just typed a head into stable diffusion, you would get a picture, it would be a head, but it would be very difficult to credit any specific or particular references to it, um, except, it, especially in the broad strokes, Yeah. right? But in the fine detail, you can start pointing to things that are more direct influences because of the way the diffusion process works, especially the guided diffusion process. So when it gets to the finer details, it's going to start pushing it towards specific things that it thinks are close to the text that you typed in. And it's going to start pulling more explicitly from them as it fills those details in. Um, and there's, there's, there's a bunch of research going on on this right now. Um, there's a great paper that's very recent, December 22nd. Uh, let me pull it up here, this guy. Uh, 12th December, 2022, it's called Diffusion Art or Digital Forgery, Investigating da Data Replication in Diffusion Models. Uh, and I'm glad somebody did this so I didn't have to because uh, their results are pretty great. But they really take a deep look at this relationship between like input text and captions in the training set and what images are produced and the similarity between those images. They do a really deep dive on this. And this is like, yeah. A anyway, long story short to, to what you were saying, there are general concepts that the model learns because they're evident in many, many examples. But yeah. then specific details are attributable to particular things that are associated to things in the training set that are associated as being in some sense close to the input caption. Because remember the way this is trained is, is like, you show it an image, you show it a caption, and you try to get the model to create that same image from the caption that you input. So another way to think about this is, the if the model was perfect, in other words, trained without noise, the data set was beautiful and clean, if you gave it a caption, it should generate the image that would have been in the training set to match that caption. Or another way, even if there is that caption in the training set yes. and you like randomly stumble on that and type it in, you should just get that image back. Yeah, if the model was perfect. Yeah. Um, but it's not. And in fact, we probably don't want it to be perfect because we like originality. And this is kind of like, you know how when you use stable diffusion on hugging face, there's like that guidance parameter um, that's how much to like listen to the caption, basically. Because if you if you stable diffusion generates images, if you turn that guidance all the way to zero, it will make a picture for you. Uh, and that the picture that it will create will just be like its idea of a picture. Out of all possible pictures, it will just create a picture of some kind, right? Will it create the same a picture for everybody who puts it at zero? Or it's just going to pick something totally random. So the way that stable diffusion works is it starts off with a random vector and it decodes it. Remember, it denoises yep. it. So if somebody has the same random seed, it'll create the same A picture for you. But if you if you like add guidance, but the thing is, is like, I don't know if you've noticed this effect, if you crank guidance all the way up, I think it goes to 50. You get, sometimes you get like a really good 
clear, snappy image. And, but a lot of the times you get this like fry effect. Yep. So that fry effect is from it like really trying to land in, in that right part, but there's nothing there. So it's like, it's like trying to diffuse noise. Yeah. And this is again why it makes it so complicated because the caption doesn't necessarily determine the image that you get completely. The random vector that you start with also helps. The, um, the amount of text guidance that you apply helps or changes what you get. But the reality is still the detail and imagery that it generates comes from somewhere in its training set. It may not be directly related to the caption that you punched in, but it's coming from somewhere. And for to a greater or lesser extent, different aspects of those things um, can be attributed. So it's, it's not an impossible task. It's just really, really hard. And that's why people aren't working on it because we're at the dawn of this stuff. People are figuring out like how to make this useful, how to make it fun and interesting. Like, and frankly, also like a bunch of people are trying to figure out how to make money from this. Yeah. Um, because it's a new technology and that's kind of what we do, but it's hard. The, the steel man response is the reason we don't have attribution yet is because it's a tough problem, which is not yet resolved in, in ML research. Um, but people are actively working on it in, in really important ways because in part, not least because people have asked for it. People have said, listen, this isn't like, this isn't good enough. You know, you can't, you can't just kind of launder our work through these models. You have to give people credit or like, let me opt out or tell me that I'm in there. Something. Um, you mentioned the, the lawsuit on the co-pilot side. Mm. Are there lawsuits happening on the art side or like what, what are people doing in the art community yeah. to like try to stop their work from being misappropriated. Yeah. So the class action lawsuit against Copilot is because I think it's been shown to verbatim um, regurgitate code that is licensed open source. And so there's a copyright issue there. Yep. Um, we'll see how that shakes out. I'd be really interested to see because one of the things, as I talked about that I fear the most is an increase in the power of copyright law over derivative works. I'm frankly terrified of that bad situation for everybody except Disney, like I said, and I guess Microsoft. In art land, I think... And is that, wait, sorry, sorry to interrupt there, but is, is this one that like, that will end up going to the Supreme Court? It feels weird that whatever no judge idea. randomly gets this case is going to decide so much of what happens in the future with this technology. Like it feels like it has to be appealed up to the highest levels. And I then at that point, you want a bunch of 80 year olds deciding this either. I don't know. I hope that it's the judge from the Oracle Google case because he took the time to learn about the technology and get a feel for it and understand what an API was before he made that judgment. Hmm. Um, so I'm hoping we get someone like him um, to, to sort of decide this case. But it is, like you said, it's like important. I don't yeah. think it'll go to the Supreme Court, but it's, it's, it's very important and, and probably will decide the future. The other thing that I want to add before we finish the episode is, so we, there's like a lot of unstructured data on the internet, but what people realized is if you want the model to do a specific thing, you have to go out and find the specific data. And so that's how Instruct GPT and ChatGPT are created. And there's actually people creating data for them. People who are like having text conversations, which are then fed into the data set. Huh. So with respect to copyright, right? It's really clear on like GitHub what the licensing is. Software licensing is something that's been covered a lot. So the actual challenge is, is more structured and straightforward. There's a legal theory. Over in Artland, there's two things. One, Dolly E2 is proprietary. Um, so you don't really know what's in it. But yeah. again, I, f I feel like OpenAI have been pretty scrupulous about what they, where they get the data from. And on the other side, with stable attribution, uh, stable diffusion, nobody really knows, owns that data set. Um, it's like publicly available stuff from the internet. I don't know. It's your problem. And like, do you want to go through the terms of service of every single website that might be in common crawl? Nobody's going to do that. AI might um, at some point, but yeah. AI might at some point, truly. Um, so nobody's going to do that. So like, there's, there's not really a legal challenge. Cause like, who do you legally challenge? The, the weights are open source. You're going to, you're going to like put DRM in there. That's terrible. Um, so it's really hard. It, it hasn't really started. Although there, there is like, there are petitions out there from like uh, people who are like, oh yeah, we need to like lobby Congress. And then you look at who's behind some of those petitions and it's like Disney, Yeah, Disney lawyers. We've talked about this. It's... Yeah. Um, yeah, so like, so that's the thing. So 
we'll see we'll see how the copyright shakes out. So you know, we talked about these unstructured data sets. We talked about how they're like scraped from the internet, like they're pretty noisy. So one thing that we discovered is if we want the model to do a particular thing, we need to go out and get specific data. So when people do like Dream Booth or fine tuning stable diffusion, they need specific data. Um, and one thing that's surprising, which maybe a lot of people aren't aware of, is models like Instruct GPT or Chat GPT are fine-tuned on not data that's collected from the internet, but there are literally rooms of people who are having chat conversations about different topics that they're given to have conversations about to train the model to know how to have a conversation or to follow instructions. That's um, and is, is there something special about those people? Like when I ask about Aristotle, do they have like an Aristotle scholar having a conversation or it's really just for the structure yeah. of like how a human might have a conversation and answer questions? It's some structure, some content. It's mostly structure. Um, there are services out there though who are very focused on providing very high quality data with domain experts. Hmm. One example of this is models intended for mathematics. Um, there are companies out there who were like, yeah, we're going to put like math experts or at least people proficient in mathematics on these things to like help create these data sets. So we've like gone full circle almost where like structured data sets, very highly curated people worked on this to Nope, just ingest the internet to, wait, we need highly curated data sets, which are like created by humans again to feed the machine. I wonder if that's, you know, because there's this cycle in hardware, right? Where it's like, you put the RAM closer to the CPU, you take it away from the CPU because you get more RAM, then you put it closer to the CPU. And this just like goes over and over and over and over again in computer hardware. I wonder if this isn't going to be like a cycle in ML. Huh. We'll like use, use all this contracted data to like fine tune it. And then we're like, okay, no, we need a lot more data for the next size models. We just ingest everything again. And it's like, it'll give us these great capabilities. But then we'll be like, okay, no, now we want these new ones. So we better fine tune it, create this new data. We'll see. And is that is a way to think of that? That is like open AI contracting somebody to fill in the gaps that it just like can't find on the internet? Or like, I would, how are they I, determining what, to, what yeah. to pay for essentially? Yeah, that's a big open question. Cool. Uh, <laughs> It's like right now it's like hope that it's good. W what's happening with this with this like human created data is you're you've got the model, you've got GPT and then you want to weight the model to like give more frequently like cuz like remember we talked about it. All it's doing is predicting. Yep. So you want to push its predictions in a particular direction and the way that you do that is like show it more examples of the thing you want it to predict making them more likely. But whether or not they're getting what they want and if it's good, open question. Um, hmm. I've talked to a bunch of people who are like working on this and they're like, yeah, we, we really don't know. We like give them guidance and we like hope it's good. Because again, the problem is you need so much data that no human can sit down and look at all of it. Um, and you can't so, go in and just tinker with the, like it wouldn't be more efficient to just like tinker with the weights where you're like, yeah, we want more of that. Nobody knows how to do that yet. <laughs> um, there are, there is research. Um, finding concept, there was a great paper about finding like concepts embedded inside large language models. In the future, we might be able to go in and just tinker with the weights if we know what to do. But this is a dark art right now. And in fact, interpretability research is mostly about what are these weights doing? Like the stuff that Anthropic in particular very publicly works on and other, other people too, is what computation is being performed <laughs> by these weights that's a question we don't know. We don't know the answer to. Like, what is it actually physically doing in terms of an algorithm? That's interpretability research. It's an open question that we're working it's on. It's right because it, you know, like when it's easy to say, like if you look back in a hundred years, like this is all like primitive. Like that feels like a very clear place where it'll feel very funny and primitive. That like the thing that we did was just hire a bunch of people to have conversations that like are kind of more like what we wanted because we had no other yep. way of figuring out how to get the model to do yep. that thing more often. Yeah, and I mean, that's kind of how I feel about prompt engineering yeah. um, and like fine tuning the way we do it now. is like, okay, well, fine tuning is re like you find some more images of the stuff that you want more of, and then you train the model some more on just that stuff. And so I, th I feel like all this stuff is so primitive, comparatively speaking. Um, I feel like, you know, we've, we've got this big hammer and we're just kind of bashing stuff because it's all we know how to do. But look, maybe in the future... Um, and with GPT-4 kind of imminent, maybe in the future we'll find out that it doesn't matter. Maybe in the future we just have to wait for the next biggest model. But I, I think that for now to move as fast as we want to move. So it's like, I want an image, like I want a model that produces great human avatars today. I'm not going to wait for like the giant 
release in, in a year or two of the next great image model. I want it right now, so I'm going to find ways to do that. Um, and it's, again, the, the thing the open sourcing has been great for is, is people just hacking with this all the time. Figuring it out in public in a way where like an average person with a little bit of knowledge of computers can like figure something out and share it very quickly. Whereas before this was very much the domain of research labs. And I think that's a really cool time to be working on stuff. I, I, this makes me think of just a bunch of weird stuff. One of which is... We like talk how, about weird stuff here all the time. It's what like, we do. <laughs> how low fidelity a human name is. Like Packy McCormick is kind of weird, mm. uh, but there's still a bunch of Packy McCormicks out there, particularly in mm. Ireland, where like I couldn't go into a search thing, into a stable diffusion, even if it were better, and just say like, make an image of Packy McCormick. It would be like, which one? Which one? I wonder if like our names have to adapt to be more unique. So it's like, <laughs> Are you hey, make an image of like, R7 we need to be more P2. distinct to the AI. <laughs> we need to, each of us, if we want, unless we want to have to fine tune the models on ourselves over time, then we have to at least have our own like identifier that the AI knows. That, you're right. That is that is a truly insane thing that you just said. <laughs> <laughs> That's when we know we'll have lost the world. Yeah, I hope when to our, not live in that future. Like I'm we, already scared. Like Elon does, yeah. I'm already scared of how people adapt their behavior to social media algorithms, right? Totally. Like every YouTube has the same thumbnail where it's like a bearded guy looking surprised at something. Um, Dude, I, the, the worst, and I, I feel bad saying this, but I, you know, the guy who was a few years ahead of me in high school just passed away and I was trying to Google it and look it up. And for his name, nothing came up. Like, there were no articles, like for whatever reason, it wasn't in the news, but there were like 10 to 15 YouTube thumbnails of an image of a car crash that then were just random Indian guys talking about him as if he were a celebrity having died. It's like, and you have to imagine, like he wasn't famous. You have to imagine like anytime there's an obituary, there's 10 to 15 people in the world making these YouTube videos. Cause for some, whatever reason people click on them, it's wild. Yeah. And, and so this is one of the things that does worry me. People are adapting their behavior to the algorithm because engagement is very powerful. People want to be seen yep. um, and heard. And, you know, like the classic thing is like YouTuber voice, which I'm grateful that we don't have, um, TikTok, like there's certain presentation of content that's expected that would probably never have organically emerged if you asked random people to make a short form video, for example, right? It's just because they see that that works and so they copy it. Um, and like de, de facto, what, what's happening here is we're adapting our behavior to the algorithm. Although the algorithm itself adapts to our behavior, which comes back to this like indirect attribution thing we've talked about before. It's like, well, it's kind of both. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Cool. I guess next time we talk about exactly what we do about this this yeah. issue right now. Yeah, we've been um, at Chroma, we've been working pretty hard on the attribution problem for the last several weeks because we think this is a really important thing. And we also think that like these technologies ought to be working for people as opposed to just creating yet more fire for people to talk past each other. Um, and hopefully by then we'll have something pretty cool to show you. I can't wait to see it. Anton, All thank right. you for teaching me about data. All right, Packy, great to chat. See you next time.